Good evening, everyone. This is Vanessa Nordyke, City Councilor for Ward 7. Please call the roll. Mayor Bennett? Here. Member Kaser? Absent. M Member Anderson, Tom Anderson? Thank you. Uh, Member Nanke? Here. Member Leong? Here. Member Osik? Absent. Member Hoy? Here. Member Nordyke? Here. Member Lewis? Here. Member Do Carmo? Absent. Member Tigan? Here. Member Chirac? Here. Member Davis? Here. Member McCoy? Here. Member William Anderson? Here. Member Sund? Here. Sund. Member Milton? Absent. Thank you very much. Would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you. You may be seated. All right, folks. So I have called to order the meeting of our budget committee for January 15, 2020. At first, we have public testimony. This is an opportunity for members of the public to weigh in. And I am looking around the room to see if anyone has signed up. I'm seeing zero for this evening. So I will just uh, remind folks who are watching on television, we welcome input. The budgetary process is a crucial process. So if you are interested in providing comment in person or written comment, please avail yourself of the opportunity to do so. <coughs> Moving on. Minutes. Our last meeting was May 8, 2019. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes for the May 8 meeting? I move approval of the minutes from May, 18, May 8, 2019, City of Salem and Urban Renewal Agency Budget Committee meeting. Second. Second by Member William Anderson. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Motion carries. Thank you. Action items. So uh, we don't have a whole lot in the way of action items tonight. Uh, but the first item is election of officers. As many of you may recall, I served as vice chair historically. I am not seeking a leadership position for this year. I am focusing on getting up to speed as our newest member of city council and focusing on priorities that face my ward. So with that in mind, I would entertain nominations for chair of the budget committee. Yes, member Hoy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I nominate Paul Tigan for chair. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Did we have a nay? <laughs> no. We Did, no You're good? All right. Very good. Well, congratulations, Member Tigan. As soon as we finish for these action items, would you like to come up here and take my place? Certainly. All right. Well, I'll just wrap up. How about vice chair? Any nominations? I nominate Councillor Kara Kayser. I have conferred with her and she is willing to accept. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. And last but not least, we now need a nomination for Office of Secretary. Any nominations? I got nothing for you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll nominate Steve McCoy. Oh, perfect. Second. Second. Excellent. <laughs> That's my excellent parochial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nomination by Member Bennett, second by Hoy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, thank you. Motion carries. All right, folks, I will now pass the gavel to our new chair. Thank you, Member Tigan. <laughs> yeah, don't be afraid of that thing. Just make yeah. it sign. <laughs> yep, I'm good. Break it I'll, I'll leave that for him. That's the script. Congratulations. Thank you. So end of my reign of terror. <laughs> okay, moving on to uh, 
Agenda item number five, information items. I'd like to ask Budget Officer Eggleston to review the information items and present the five-year forecasts under the agenda heading Special Orders of Business. If I may, Mr. Chair, I'd like to introduce myself to the budget committee members. My name's Robert Barron. I'm the new uh, chief financial officer. So I've met, of course, all the city council members, but uh, this is my first opportunity to say hello to you. Uh, I've been in position since June of 2019, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Josh Eggleston. He, um, uh, He's been before you before, uh, but he's just been elevated into a management position uh, 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 for the city, and he is serving as our budget officer, so he's going to begin with the uh, budget presentation. I'll have a little bit for you in the middle, and then he'll wrap up towards the end. So uh, I'd like to welcome Josh and do his first presentation as his budget officer this evening. Thank you, Bob. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm Joshua Eggleston, the city's budget officer. Uh, the information items for this, uh, this evening's meeting include four <coughs> quarterly financial reports. I will not be reviewing these tonight, but they are provided for your information as part of the city's, city's discipline of monitoring, analysis, and reporting. The main focus of our time this evening is the city's five years uh, financial forecasts. I would like to recognize and thank department analysts, directors, and staff that dedicated the hours necessary to assist the budget office in producing Susie, this. Can you speak a little louder? Yeah, of course. Sorry. This important financial planning document. The city forecasts for 14 of 24 total funds, but tonight the presentation will focus on four of those funds. The Willamette Valley Communication Center, or WVCC, transportation services, the utility, and general funds. And you should have my presentation in front of you also if you need to follow along. <clears throat> Why we forecast. Forecasting is a way that the city can identify financial issues before they, be before they become critical. Similar to your own finances, the city considers new income and expenses in the coming years to be able to plan for those, any challenges that might be coming up. The forecast is also an important step in the budget process and helps to inform your important work when reviewing and recommending the fiscal year 2021 budget in a few short months. The forecast does not predict the future, but demonstrates financial trends and imbalances. The goal of sustainable service delivery, which is one of the seven goal areas in the council's strategic plan, is the alignment of city services and resources and the maintenance of a fund balance for the future. One example of where the city has used financial forecasting effectively is in the case of the Transportation Services Fund and the streetlight fee that helped provide a dedicated source of revenue for the streetlight electricity in the streetlight fund and gave the transportation fund some needed stability. Another recent example that has greatly improved the outlook for the general fund is the implementation of the city operations fee that took effect January 1st. While the operations fee has not eliminated the use of working capital or savings, it has plugged the immediate hole, and this is the first forecast in recent history that does not end with a negative working capital balance. By modeling a baseline forecast, we can provide the budget committee, city council, and our community members with a long-range perspective of today's financial decisions. And feel free to ask questions as I'm going along. The forecasts presented this evening are built around a baseline set of assumptions that represent a reasonable level of consistency with the status quo. We believe the forecasts are objective, but there are bound to be variations from estimates. This work is done at a very granular level. Property tax information is received from Polk and Marion County, and individual properties are compared year over year. This level of analysis has produced highly accurate estimates over the past several years. Personnel costs, the major expense associated with delivering services, are calculated at the position level to enhance accuracy. The forecast uses annual market adjustments for salaries and employees' rates contained in labor agreements where applicable. The first of the four funds that we are focusing on this evening is the Willamette Valley Communication Center. It supports the provision of emergency dispatch services to 29 police, fire, and emergency medical service agencies in Marion, Polk, and Lincoln County.
This display should be fairly familiar. You'll find it uh, in all of our previous forecasts in recent years. Uh, there will be two slides depicting the actual forecast. This depiction uh, resembles the display on page 36 of your forecast document for the WVCC forecast. The main takeaway for this forecast display is a stable level of ending working capital throughout the forecast period. This second display converts that same numeric table to a graphic that demonstrates, demonstrates the relationship of revenues and net expenditures and the trajectory of working capital. As you can see, the yellow line, which represents the working capital, is fairly stable over the five-year period. Member Hoy. Thank you. Josh, does this consider uh, any potential changes, fundamental changes with WVCC that, that might be on the table currently for consideration, consolidation, anything like that? Or is this just status quo as if we're going to continue doing business like we are today forever? Uh, all of the forecasts presented this evening are, represent the status quo. Thank you. Member Bennett. Uh, Josh, do you, do you then uh, take there? There's no consideration of of uh, the uh, the items mentioned by Councillor Hoy, or where we hear discussion out in the community about groups moving to other services that may uh, may be covered right now. Uh, let's see. That may be paying into this fund. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's ongoing discussions at both the, the state legislature level and local levels about consolidation. Uh, we don't incorporate that into this forecast, but it is a consideration. I don't know if Deputy Chief Belshaw wants to. If I may, uh, City Manager Steve Powers, certainly the forecast, though, does include uh, planned and, and discussed uh, capital projects. Uh, Computer-aided dispatch, for example, is a need uh, for WVCC. Uh, the forecasts across all the funds do not include scenario, direct scenarios on what might happen. Uh, we do have in the, in the uh, handout, in the paper, uh, the full forecast, I don't know if it's part of this uh, presentation, there we go, uh, where we, we do try to present information for you that indicates risk. And those risks would include a change, for example, with WBCC if the revenue structure were somehow to change. Uh, for other funds, the, the variability is, is on other factors. But for the WBCC, that would be probably the closest we would be able to get to you know, what would happen if the revenue structure were to change. Yeah, that would, that would be a very fundamental change in the forecast, the service delivery. Thank you. Uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, this is the forecast variable analysis. Uh, while we attempt to be objective and as accurate as possible with our forecasting, the forecasts are subject to variability with actual results that differ from the dozens of assumptions within the model. With this in mind, we utilize the representation you see on this slide to demonstrate through the forecast period our best estimate of the result of working capital and what happens with just 1% variation in revenues and expenditures. Where available, the adopted policy level for working capital or fund balance is overlaid on this information. For WVCC, the gold line uh, across the five-year grouping represents the policy adopted by the WVCC board, those 29 agencies, to help guide its budget recommendations. The blue bar at the center of each grouping represents the result to the working capital based on the forecast. So that ties to the two uh, displays you saw before. The green bar represents uh, forecast result augmented by 1% better revenue growth and 1% additional expenditure savings, better expenditure savings. The red bar reflects no change to revenue as the annual rate increases are part of the WVCC board's plan for ongoing financial stability and the opposite tra trajectory for savings. Uh, I don't know if the, if the chair needs to recognize me or the man who's doing the work needs to recognize me. Um, Josh, could you explain, I'm looking at the, the green lines, and if it's 1%, it goes up pretty quickly. Um, I, I wonder if you could explain how that figure was arrived at. Sure, so, so the green bar represents 1% additional revenue and 1% less expenditures. So it's a net 2% gain on that working capital. Mm -hmm. 
and it has a, a pretty extreme compounding effect over the five years. Okay. And especially for this fund, uh, where you're talking a little bit smaller dollars, it looks a lot more extreme. Okay. Thank you very much. Can I go ask a question? Please, yeah. Member Bennett. Thank you. So, in the on the green on the green bar, what are the variables that uh, you consider when you look at that one percent? I mean, is it? Uh, we always hear about the 911 fee, all those kinds of things. Are those the kinds of variables? Or? Uh, for, for this this display, it's much more basic than that. It's a okay. simple percentage of, of revenues. Uh, this forecast does take into account a larger rate increase next year, to, and that takes into account the uh, 911 tax increase and agency's ability to pay for that increase. It, is, that, uh, is that dependent then on, on others' action, other units of government action? So it, it represents the rate that's approved by that WVCC board. Okay. And it's not approved yet. Okay. It's a forecasted rate. Okay. But there are, uh, your forecasting indicates does it indicate that they you anticipate approval of these kinds of rate increases then? Okay. okay. Given the current set of assumptions, yes. Okay. Uh, the green bar represents the forecast result augmented by 1%. The red bar reflects no change to revenue. Because of that uh, way they elect the uh, or they approve the rate, it's just a 1% uh, on expenditure savings is what the red bar represents. Under every scenario except the red scenario for the last two years, they maintain their fund balance above their policy. Any questions on WVCC before I move on? Member Leon. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the, the big report. On page uh, 36, there is mention of a risk that WVCC, um, there might be a possible withdrawal of the Marion County Sheriff's Office. And uh, I guess my, my question is, is there, I mean, it currently says that it's, the action's been placed on hold while they're evaluating all possible options and associated costs. Are you, are you still in, or is, it, is there, we're still having conversations about what they're planning on doing in the long term? Steve, Actually, you uh, uh, Chief Niblock is involved with the uh, oversight of, of the communications center and, and may be able to speak to the current status of discussions between the Marion County Sheriff and WVCC. Sure. Uh, Mike Niblock, Fire Chief. So, yes, uh, there have been discussions ongoing uh, for probably a couple of years. Um, with the previous sheriff had indicated he wanted to uh, withdraw from WVCC and issued a letter stating that there's a 180 day notice that's required um, for that to happen. Um, they have since decided at this time not to withdraw um, and they have, they have not pulled their, their notice, if you will, but they are, they are staying in WVCC for this budget cycle. So um, they are still evaluating, they have a new sheriff uh, and a new under sheriff, so they're evaluating some of those things. Some of the issues that they have uh, may be able to be solved with uh, software and, and linking the CADs together. Um, so we're still exploring uh, options there that would, would help the sheriff with some of their service issues uh, between the two dispatch centers. So 60% is dispatched through WBCC and 40% are dispatched through METCOM. Member Hoy. Just to clarify, Chief, when you say this budget cycle, do you mean the current one or the upcoming one? The upcoming one. Thank you. Member McCoy. Chief, why, why is it that 60-40 split? So the uh, Marion County Sheriff's cover, obviously, all of Marion County, uh, and METCOM as a, as a uh, dispatch center has a portion of that area. And so when calls are, are originated in those areas, they go to the METCOM center and then they're relayed to WVCC so they can be dispatched for the Sheriff's Department. There could be some time delay in that. I know it doesn't make sense, but that's just how it's set up. And so we, the conversations have been, how can we better, um, for officer safety and those types of things, facilitate a better communications model? And, and those are some of the things that we're looking at. That was the reasoning behind. And then cost savings, I think, was the other thing the Sheriff's were looking at. Um, um, Metcom, um, 
gave them a bid lower than what WVCC provides, and I don't want to speak on the behalf of the sheriff, but um, I don't think it was comparing apples to apples. Um, and I think they realize that, and I think that's why they're staying. So, other questions? So, um, do we ever pursue going the other way? So we're, so I understand this. We're doing the Marion County, WVCC is doing the Marion County, and METCOM is doing they are dispatched, Marion County Sheriff is dispatched by two different dispatch centers because of the border between the dispatch centers. So 40% of Marion County Sheriff's calls are received at METCOM and 60% of their calls are received at WVCC. So is there some way that we could go get the 40% to WVCC and, and increase their revenue? They're a government agency just like we are, and we've had conversations with them, and they have not not produced a, a merger of, of centers at this point. Member Sun. The CAD capital, uh, the 2.4 million, is that on the scale for historical capital expenditures for this fund? Is that sort of, we have we done this before, that a lot, a little? <clears throat> I'm going to see if Ryan has a good answer for you. <laughs> so I'll take a stab at that. and then. <laughs> uh, so we, uh, we're in the process of replacing our computer-aided dispatch program, uh, which is short for CAD. Uh, and um, the, the, uh, the process is a pretty lengthy process, and we have uh, set some money aside for that. Um, in the previous years and, and through the budgeting process. And we are in the process now. We've released um, our RFP and are in that, in that phase of it. Um, this is, a, it's like a computer. So computers change about every five years. Um, our system is out of date uh, and is no longer um, uh, supported from the stance that they will not reprogram it for us. So it's, it's end of life, it's still functioning but they aren't going to change anything that we wanted to change in the system like we would with a brand new system. So it's time to update it. Um, Dispatch has replaced their phone system. They've updated some of their computers. And now this is just the next piece that, that is uh, due to be replaced. So we have to maintain. Uh, I mean, this is a high level, important um, piece of equipment that needs to be maintained at the highest level. And so that's why we're in the process of doing that. Member Anderson. Thank you. This is not for you, Chief. It's for Josh. <coughs> you know, I looked at the, the slide you've got up there, and I saw that in this fiscal year that's about to end, the green, the blue, and the red are the same. And I thought, well, that's good. It's all, you know, evened out. But then I look at the same uh, green, yellow, and red on the transportation fund and the utility fund, and I see they're not. So. Is that just a coincidence that they all happen to even out here? Uh, I think for the WVCC fund, it's a recognition that half the year is over and there's not much room for variation. Okay, not yeah, because the contracts are signed, everything's going to continue yeah. the way it is till the next fiscal year, Correct. which is not the case in the other ones we look at. Th there could still be some variation. Sure. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the second fund is the Transportation Services Fund uh, with the Public Works Department. Uh, they support the or operation and maintenance of the city's streets, traffic signals, and sidewalks. The Transportation Services Fund provides the financial structure for the department to respond to the city council goals that address long-term support for community needs for safety, livability, environmental health, and economic development. Two factors have substantially contributed to the stabilization of the Transportation Services Fund, as displayed in this forecast result from the top of page 22 in your forecast document. The first contributing factor is the implementation of the streetlight fee that we discussed earlier uh, to relieve the cost of operating and maintaining the streetlight system. The savings to this fund for electricity costs are about $1.3 million each year. And then the second factor, in 2017, the Oregon Legislature passed House Bill 2017 to make significant investment in transportation infrastructure, the second factor aiding this fund. State highway revenue, which is distributed to local jurisdictions by population, is anticipated to increase over the next five years. Based on the state's revenue projections, the Transportation Services Fund will have the capacity to sustain current operations 
but will be unable to support any significant structural pavement maintenance and reconstruction activities. Uh, just as a graphic display, fiscal year 2020 began with working capital of 3.05 million and year and estimates reflect use of approximately 0.31 million to balance expenditures with an ending working capital of approximately 1.27 million at the end of the five year forecast. Similar to the WVCC variability, this display uh, within the Transportation Services Fund forecast takes what we believe to be the probable result represented by the blue bar and augmenting it by 1% of additional revenue and 1% of additional expenditure savings. The outcome represented by the green bar is a best case scenario. On the other end of the scenario there is the red bar depiction of 1% less revenue and 1% greater expense or lowered savings. Any questions on the Transportation Services Fund? Member Anderson. Thank you. So we hear this on a macro level all the time about the working capital is going down, it's going down, and um, then we're in trouble. And on a micro level, it seems to be happening in the Transportation Fund. And I'm curious as to whether this can be sustained and what are the, I see Director Fernandez getting up, and what are the anticipated measures to deal with this? Thank you. Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. Thank you, uh, Councillor Anderson. So, so this is concerning to us. When we saw the forecast, uh, we said, well, boy, I said, I really don't like this. Uh, so, however, this is a, uh, I've been here a few years, and this is a fund that uh, early in my career really only carried $500,000 in beginning working capital. So we have been very fortunate. Uh, me and uh, Mark Bechtel used to be on, uh, on the transportation staff, and we'd worry about this for years. And we'd, we'd, we'd make do with only a $500,000 uh, operating uh, capital. So, so to see even... Uh, 1.27 at the end of five years is really not a bad thing uh, from that standpoint. We do see it going down. We're making, uh, we've made investments as we've saved money. Uh, we were able to repave Mission Street. We were able to repave uh, Orchard Heights. Uh, we are applying $1.8 million in sidewalk repair. We have $125,000 a year for safe crossing programs. Uh, so and the and the uh, the revenues are a bit volatile with respect to uh, the state gas tax. So when I looked at this, I said, well, we can let it go for a year or two, and see what happens. Uh, uh, there's some seasonal staff that we're converting to full-time staff that adds a little more uh, expense. One, two, three years down the road, long before we get to this level, uh, if this continues, we'll have to make. Uh, some adjustments. I just didn't think that this year, you know, this is a, a, a warning sign. Uh, we're aware of it. That's why we forecast. Uh, if the trend continues, then in a couple of years, we'll have to make some changes. But uh, if revenues improve, if we have some savings, uh, the Revenue Task Force spoke about a local gas tax. If some council decides that maybe that's a good idea in a couple of years, then we won't have to worry about this. Well, so. <laughs> which we might have to decide if that trend keeps going. That might right. be one of the ways to deal with it. Right, but I'm not going to put the council in that situation. No, I mean, no, we no, We will make no. the changes long before there's a crisis. Okay. So. Then um, we, we have been talking about various bond measures, and I, would that be another way to deal with it? Not no, this. Not, not this, this, because the okay. bond measures are strictly for capital be projects. Got it. We did a couple of capital projects a couple of years ago yeah. when we had a little extra money. There's no capital projects in here. All right. Beyond Thanks. the sidewalk repair and that right. kind of thing. Well, Member Bennett. Can you, uh, can you then, Peter, describe uh, the impact on uh, sort of your standard neighborhood. What, what, what does this mean in our neighborhoods then? Well, today, it's really uh, uh, the status quo that we, that we have today. We do our sidewalk program. We go around the different neighborhoods. But no uh, enhancement. I'm sorry? No enhancement. No enhancements. Okay. You know, so so slurry sidewalk seals. repair, slurry seals uh, are back, uh, are potholes. Back. Uh, are you keeping up with slurry seals then? Well, we're doing the best that we can with what we have. I mean. Well, what's that? 
what's that mean then? In that that our street system is generally you know in B minus condition and. You know, I mean, at some point, that's why we need the bond issues. At right. some point, uh, we but really don't. is that don't... affected here? I mean, is that in this report, this portion of the forecast, the the, the lack of, of the major declining slurry seals? Or... Yeah, well, it's, there's there's no decline in slurry. Okay. But slurry is really a local street. Yeah. Uh, program. So our arterials don't hardly get any any maintenance. Are potholes uh, in here? Yes, potholes are in here. So Slurry what, seals what, are in here, sidewalks should, are in here. What should people expect then in a neighborhood that has a, a mix of arterial collector? No yeah, that, no. that over time, their potholes will be filled. They're, they're, uh, okay. If we are still responsible for the sidewalks, at some point we'll come around and repair the sidewalks. Uh, their street trees will look nice. Uh, and uh, at some point we'll slurry seal their street if the street can take it. When does that fall apart on this? What year are you looking uh, at? I would be, if this trend continued right. uh, in 2022, in year three, I'd have to start proposing some changes. And that would affect those kinds something. of- Something, right. Something, so, yeah. so it might be it might be that we stop slurries, it might be that we reduce sidewalk repair, it might be that we cut some staff, uh, you know, I mean, it yeah. can be, it can okay. be any number of things. Okay, thank so, you. Member William Anderson. Um, if I could ask two quick questions. Sure. Uh, first of all, when the budget committee was meeting um, a few months ago, a common theme was if you don't maintain now, it's much more expensive later. Yes. So when you're talking about in a couple of years, we might need to do something big to fix this, would it not make more sense to maintain now? Oh, you're, you're singing my song, absolutely. Uh, the transportation fund, unfortunately, has never been able, we've never been able to maintain at that level for the transportation system. Okay, so the second question, <clears throat> if a business is thinking about investing in Salem and they look at these forecasts and they see that, do you think that might discourage a business from possibly making a big long-term investment? It certainly here? could, but, but now we're balancing, so I could make cuts now, but then something would have to give because there's no more money. So, so something would have to give, and what would have to give would be, as we, as I was discussing, you know, response to the mayors. So we might not do slurry seal, we might not do sidewalks, we, you know, we might cut back on other things. So, so whatever we are doing, then that very business might not see any improvements in front of their door. So, so yeah, it's a very difficult. Uh, we 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 struggle with this every year. Is that that balancing of we want to do as much as we can, but there's only a limited amount of money. Member Sun. So when people ask about you know streets and potholes and these things that imp impact the day to day, and then also ask about new taxes like the operating fee and the employee paid payroll tax that'll be on the ballot, what's the best way to sort of explain then that, of course, that's going into a different fund, right. but people care about these things, right? So right. what would we tell, what, what do you tell people that? Vote for the gas tax when the council proposes it. <laughs> So Whenever that comes, it's that <laughs> narrow. It's that narrow of yeah. A, this uh, the transportation fund is is uh, uh, our allocation of the state gas tax and some other fees and revenues. Like the utility fund pays the the transportation fund for uh, uh, for street sweeping, for example. You know that's funded by so the street sweepers are operated by transportation, but actually funded by the utility uh, and the utility also pays for pavement repair when we cut the street to put in a new sewer line or that kind of thing but but strictly speaking it's the gas tax and and uh, there's nothing else there's no general fund or you know just, just a, a skosh to do some things so right all these other revenues is to address other issues that the city has not this issue that's why the street light fee i mean here we are several years later and we're still talking about it because the street light fee was so critical mm -hmm. to stabilizing this fund uh you know to remove the the uh uh, uh the street light fee the electric uh, uh component you know it was a savings of one and a half million dollars 1.8 million dollars so that really stabilized it uh you know but this fund still pays for the street trees so this fund sends a, a couple million dollars to the general fund to, to us to parks to maintain street trees so those are you know this yeah. is you know you're on the you, you you begin to understand this in the in the in the budget committee that you know there, there's all these little pots but the pots are in so so when somebody says hey i'm paying an extra eight bucks but you know what about streets different 
That's yeah. going to be that's going to be another topic, a conversation that we'll have. To another have. tax. Yeah. 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 Okay, um, Member Bennett. Uh, Peter, what about the uh, franchise fee? Uh, how how is that allocated in this particular? Is this part of? It's not part of this fund. The franchise fee all goes to the general fund. Despite despite the impact that uh, at least I assume some of the collection, the franchise collections based on impact on streets. And all of it. All, all of the franchise is based on use by public right. and private utilities of the public right of way. But many, many years ago, the decision was made that all of those revenues go to the general fund. Is there, uh, is there any flexibility in the franchise fee to take a look at how? Sure, every dollar, but every dollar that comes off, I, we've had these conversations. Well, I know, <laughs> in the level of franchise, not in how it's spent, but let's just talk about uh, I think we're at, I don't want to get out of my lane, but I think they're pretty well maxed out, but that's Ryan with well, are there are there no. services going on in the public right of way that we don't currently uh, franchise, or that we don't collect fees be that are using our public right of way? Uh, Ryan Zink, uh, franchise administrator. Um, so, I, I, of the utilities that are that are in the right of way that are actually using the right of way, we I think as as uh, that are using, Director Fernandez, yeah. yeah, we've pretty much maxed that out. I mean, there there are some areas that we have some additional flexibility. So, just as an example, there is no cap. There's no legislated cap on uh, solid waste franchise fees. Uh, there's you know so there's some areas where there are, there could be some flexibility and. and uh, it was it four years ago we did increase the franchise fee on solid waste from 5% to 7%. And for a couple of years, that additional 400000 did go to, to transportation. And that was a decision that, uh, that this committee made. Um, and then uh, I think in 2019, so just a year or two ago, um, the decision with, with the additional transportation uh, uh, gas tax we were getting, that 400,000 back to the general fund, and since there's uh, there was some additional backfill for the transportation fund, so there is some flexibility there. But in terms of the total collection of franchise fees, we've pretty much maxed that out. Are there areas uh, that we might? I mean, cell service, mm -hmm. uh, uh, broadband, all those other kinds of services that are going on in the or programs going on in the right of way are all of those as well paying franchise fees yes okay yeah so what's uh, what's been the impact of losing the uh, uh, wired telephone the standard in-home telephone uh, we are seeing uh, starting to see a decline um, in telecommunications tax uh, so um, and, and really the biggest threat quite frankly is is uh, uh, federal legislation that, um, that precludes know. our ability to get into it. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Now we do work closely, uh, you know, with Ryan, and and an example is the antennas, the the 5G antennas that are going up mm -hmm. uh, on the street lights. So so they're paying a franchise, but they're also paying rent okay. to the city for using the street light. So the franchise goes to the general fund, but the rent is going to the streetlight fund to fund 156. Okay. So, so it's not here, uh, but it's in one. It's in 156 in the in the streetlight fund to be able to continue to install new streetlights and do those things. So, so we are working to find those opportunities okay. wherever we can. Okay. It's just that the general franchise, that was a ship that sailed a long time ago, and any dollar that we would take to bring back to here is a is a dollar that you got to plug in the general fund. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, proceed. The uh, third fund we're discussing this evening is the utility fund. It supports the ongoing operation and maintenance of the utility, including treatment, storage, and delivery of drinking water to residents, business, and industries. Collection, conveyance, and treatment of wastewater before it returns to Willamette River and collection and conveyance of stormwater runoff from streets, buildings, and other hard surfaces throughout the system to reduce the risk of flooding and to protect the environment. In addition, the fund supports the payment of utility revenue bonds for system infrastructure improvements, as well as annual transfers to the capital improvement fund for pay-as-you-go capital projects. The city's utility is in very good shape. When the water advisory occurred in the summer of 2018, the city was able to navigate the financial challenge and plan for investments without an immediate rate impact. This forecast anticipates a $60 million debt issuance in March of 2020 for projects focused on water treatment and a supplemental water supply. 
Continued improvements must be made to this utility at a sustainable pace, balancing rate impacts with the rehabilitation, expansion, resiliency, and modernization needs of the system. Member Hoy. Thank you. Josh, does this uh, forecast assume a zero rate increase, or is there some standard rate increase that it assumes? Yeah. Uh, this assumes uh, the uh, the rate increases that uh, that we've talked about through the year. So, on average three, but you know they vary by as as you learned two years ago. They vary by utility, and we will be presenting a rate proposal this fall. So okay. the, the task force will start again in August, and we'll present a rate proposal in the fall. So the reason for my question yeah, is I'm trying to understand the that seems a little bit inconsistent with what the answer to my earlier question about WVCC. That we we don't make you know we we base it on current reality, not on things that could happen. We don't know that a rate increase is going to happen. Cor correct, but we make uh, general assumptions based on history. Okay, thank you, Member Nanke. Yeah, just kind of to speak to that. Yeah, the the rate increases will happen one way or the other, and it, um, if you really want to make the uh, the public angry, you'll do a zero one year, because. <laughs> Then it goes up to six, nine, twelve, um, rather rapidly. So we need to stay on that slope, which has always been <laughs> the goal of this fund, which may be different than WBCC. It depends on what their capital and, and operating needs are, and they set their slope to meet that number as well. Then I would assume. I just think it would be important for the record to show that I'm advocating for no taxes, and Member Nanke is advocating for higher taxes. <laughs> <laughs> No. I'm ad I'm I'm for keeping a, a stable utility and a safe water system. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Also, just for the record, I wasn't suggesting a zero rate increase. I was just <laughs> oh, good. wanting to understand the assumptions that were in going yeah. to this forecast. We'll push that one out there. Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Hoy wants our water system to fall apart. <laughs> I, I hope Peter, you will share at some point with the budget committee what happened, or in the council at least. What happened when we did a zero? What that uh, did? I think Councillor Nanke lived through it. And yeah, say, I lived it, through it as well. It's a it, it perfectly. It's yeah. just. It, I mean, the unfortunate thing is, uh, costs continue to escalate yeah. and needs. Uh, you saw it two years ago. I mean, we all of a sudden algae's here, and we went from, you know, we're kind of cruising along doing our thing to, oh man, now we're going to spend fifty million dollars just like that. So that's what happens in in, in the utility. Or can happen. Uh, in the utility, the working capital or savings decreases from 45.5 to 39.7 million over the forecast period, but still meets the 120 day of operating expenses that is in the council policy. In the forecast variability display, the 1% of better revenue and better savings makes an already positive result even better. Both of the blue and green bars pro provide sufficient working capital or reserves to cover the council policy. The negative variables, 1% less revenue and 1% more expense or less savings, uh, create a res result that is less than 120 days of operating costs. Member Bennett. Does, uh, does this include then uh, the work we've done with the legislature in terms of that's built in, cooked into this? That's in here. Okay. Yeah. So what, what you see here by May is uh, uh, the slight decreases uh, out in uh, uh, in the first year and then in years three, four, and five is a deliberate decision to spend more on capital. You know, so it's just more investment. You know, we want to maintain that 120 day reserve. And what that means is that, you know, we could pay for 120 days of operating without collecting a dime. Uh, we want to maintain, you know, a certain amount of, ca we're going to sell bonds now, so we have to maintain certain reserves and certain cash, there's policy, council policy related to that. Uh, but. Uh, and I still suffer from PTSD from 2007 that when we were in big trouble. So, so we want to have a good cushion, a good cash pile for the utility, uh, but we can make deliberate strategic decisions to spend some of that down, and it's all for capital. So this is strictly you know, the capital needs of, of, of the utility and, and the continuing need for, for increased service. Uh, I talked about the street sweepers. We've been running the same two street sweepers in, in town for 30 years is what Mark told me. Uh, well, you know, we might need a third one. So, so, so there's some investment in 
you know, adding a third sweeper to, to be able to keep up. So things, things like that. And then the bond issue, of course, is that what, what affects the bond issue that you'll see in a couple of weeks at the council, uh, fully uh, uh, supported by, by utility revenue. So there's no general fund revenue. Uh, but the cost of, of, the, uh, of, the, debt service. Of, of the bond, the debt service, then is built into this forecast as well, because that's already, we already need that. Excellent. So the fourth fund is the general fund, uh, which supports operations in the areas of public safety, planning, code enforcement, public library, municipal court, parks and recreation, urban development, and support services that provide a citywide benefit. This chart displays the general fund support department and the corresponding expenditure budget for year one of the five-year forecast. In the general fund, property taxes make up over half of the general fund revenues at 74.4 million forecasted for fiscal year 2021. For comparison, in the same year, the combined police and fire budgets equal $86.5 million, 12.1 million more than the property taxes. Uh, this might look familiar. We've used it for uh, many years. Uh, this graph illustrates the recent revenue expenditure history in the general fund and the results of the five-year forecast. It notes the impact of several significant actions over the past 10 years, including the closure of fire stations, elimination, elimination of approximately 40 positions about 10 years ago, and four le years of legislative PERS rate relief. During that period of PERS rate relief, the city also gained revenue from a real market revaluation and significantly less property tax losses from compression. This graph also demonstrates the use of a total of 5.9 million in working capital to balance the expenses for the three most recently completed fiscal years. Beginning this fiscal year, we see the positive impact of the city operations fee that narrows the gap between revenues and expenses. The general fund forecast table replicated on this slide appears in the publication on page 11. Thanks to the city's strong financial management practices as recognized in, in recent bond rating reviews and the factors previously noted, the city established a balance in working capital that has exceeded the council's policy of 15% of budgeted revenues. This current forecast includes multiple factors that were not recognized in the forecast from last fall. On the revenue side, the city council implemented a city operations fee that has added approximately 41.5 million in revenue over these five years. On the expenditure side, the forecast also demonstrates a lesser PERS expense than anticipated due to the reamortization of the PERS unfunded liability from Senate Bill 1049 that passed last year. There are additional components of that bill that are being litigated and the impact of those pieces are not included in the forecast. The forecast also includes a 1% expense of direct compensation beginning in January 2022 for the state, family, and medical paid leave program. And there are also some custodial and utility expenses associated with the opening of the police station included in this forecast. As you can see, working capital remains positive through the forecast, but does decline to 10.92 million in the fiscal year 2025. As a comparison, last year's forecast would have ended 2024 with a negative balance of $33.65 million. This graph, which you have just seen displayed for the three previous funds, reveals the possible scenarios for the general fund. The probable scenario is just that, the likely outcome for the next five years based on all of the assumptions, analyses, and evaluations, and calculations contained in the forecast. Any questions about the general fund? Uh, thank you. Um, so, Mr. Eccleston, um, can you go back to the the green, blue, red? It's just my understanding how we're reading it here is that even with the operational fee that's been added, beginning in fiscal year 2022, only under the rosiest of scenarios does the general fund meet its working capital policy. That is correct, yes. Okay. Member Anderson. 
following up on that, we talked about the micro on one of the earlier presentations, and now here we are in the macro, and I know from this is my sixth budget, so I understand um, the administration's um, correct policy of making as many in-flight changes as they can to, to stave off. Um, and I, I am certain that you'll come back at some point with the same sort of corrections. And I will tell you, it's been very hard for me not to mention the name Thelma and Louise. So I'll just be quiet here. Very much as I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's obviously a concern we face, but we'll just have to see uh, what happens. I have a general comment, too, that I don't know if this is the right time, and I looked at, but I'll go ahead and do it anyway. I looked at the agenda. And I, is there some place at the end where sort of we're able to talk about a wish list? If so, I'll wait, I'll wait till that time comes up. I just see public comment. Yes, uh, there is a, just a, in addition to the forecast discussion at, after, I think, point seven, we'll have just a general conversation. Okay, great, thanks. The, the words wish list don't appear in my no. <laughs> script, <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anderson. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Mr. Anderson. Um, in the discussion about some of the other matters, it seemed like people were aware of potential um, revenue things that were not yet approved. Is there anything in the pipeline for the general fund? Is there a ballot measure coming or anything that would help enhance that? So we have a presentation directly after this one to address that for the re current revenue initiatives. Member McCoy. Um, just so I understand this, I've clearly been away from this already too long. Um, I'm looking at the revenues on the you know, general fund. It says revenues, and every year it's going up. And, and in, in here, built in these revenues, as I understand it, is the operating fee at seven to eight million dollars a year. Uh, correct. So it starts so at seven. So how does it million. go from 32 to 39 if it's an eight million dollar a year increase in the from the operating fee? And then it's only five million increase the next year, but you're adding eight million a year. I don't. I'm, I'm missing something here. And that doesn't even count three or four percent or whatever you said the growth in was. Other than that, to boot. Uh, or and I can look at it another way. If it's 132 now and there's 45 million in new income, I add 45 to 132 and I come up with 177. So. I'm missing something here. Uh, excellent question. So in the in the first column, the fiscal year 2020 year end estimate, that includes $3.5 million of the operations fee because it's effective ju January 1st. Okay. So we're forecasting for that. So the increase in the next year, uh, in addition to all the normal increases, would be the balance to get to that $7.1, 7 $7.2 million for the operations fee. So the, the 132.24 to the 139.92. Okay. So so that's what? 7.2. So the next year there's another eight million in there and it doesn't go up. It so, only goes up five. So so one We're once talking the, revenue, not expenses, we're just talking revenue now. So once the operations fee is fully in effect in fiscal year twenty twenty one. The only increase we see from that is account growth and then a CPI of about 2.5% that we're forecasting for that revenue source. So you're not going to see a, a large jump in the next year. It's going to be it's fairly stable. So it gets baked in, you're saying, in the first year, and then it, all the increases after that are the three per four, whatever it is, right? Correct. Is? Just, just okay. the escalation for inflation. So, but I will go back to my question. You had 45, I heard you say, I think $45 million in increased revenue over the term of this forecast? Correct, 41.5, I believe. So is that starting from then a balance? Is, is it starting from the 132 or the year before that when it was 120 something? So it's, it's inclusive, inclusive of the operations fee that's included in 2020. So that's about three and a half million dollars and then the full operations fee for the following years. Okay. Well, if I take 45 million from 159, I get what, 114? 
So, so, so that's the, where I guess I'm missing some. Sure. So the the operations fee is spread out over all sure. five, all six years depicted there. The first year at three and a half, and the following years <coughs> at seven point two, and then escalated at two and a half percent for each year. So if you were to take that out, the result would be much much worse. Okay. So did I misunderstand the forty five million in added income, or somehow I'm just not figuring out how it's get, getting in there? And I'll stop it. <laughs> so the 41 the 41 million dollars is an aggregate it's over the whole entire period sure. so it's not in one single and, but that's, year yeah. Yeah. Keep going, Steve. Ask it again. <laughs> I believe his question is is if you add 41.5 to 154.44 you should come up with a bigger number than 173.37 yes. I think that's his fundamental <laughs> misunderstanding Maybe just let, what what portion of the increase is going to be in the first year in dollars? Uh, yeah, about three point. Yeah, three point five. So, so you can't look at the increase on any given year. It's going to be spread throughout the forecast. And I'd be happy to provide that detail and email it out to you so you can see the breakdown. Yeah, Member Anderson. Thank you. Well, perhaps um, the revenues might be forecast to be going down the other revenues we might be collecting absent the the operating fee would that be a way to look at it so that is why 45 million plus 154 you're going to also have to minus out the revenues that we're expecting to have less revenues in those years uh, i mean i agree with steve's point you add 45 million to what we have, you should have a higher rate at the end unless there's something else that is taking money away. So the revenues go up each year. So 132, 139, 144, 149, 154, 159. And is that revenue, that increase in revenue, is that due solely to the uh, um, operating fee? Uh, no, it's inclusive of all increases, property so, taxes, franchise fees. So everything is increasing. Why don't we have 45 million at the end of it? Um, so, so if if you remember my point from a little bit earlier, last year's forecast ended fiscal year 2024 with a very negative balance. So, the fact that we have the 41.5 million dollars has contributed to make it that a positive balance. Okay. Also, if I may, thank you, uh, yes, Chair Carson. On page A B, which on my uh, software here is like 64 of 75 pages of the of the forecast, we do have a general fund revenues assumptions table. It doesn't have the amounts that uh, Count, uh, Member McCoy is 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 asking about, but it does show the assumptions we're making for all of the general fund revenues, the percentage increases. And I think perhaps one clarification I, I would encourage. Uh, the budget officer to follow up with the detail for the members regarding the operations fee, but I, I, he he may have mentioned 45 million, but then he did correct himself to say 41 million is the closer to the total over the yes five and a half years uh, that we're using for the forecast and for the operations fee discussion. Yes, that is correct. Thank you. The, the 45 was in reference to a different fund. Yeah, the um, general fund revenues assumptions table, as Member Hoy has pointed out, is A3 in your large book. It is, and it does show, going back to an earlier question, uh, the only, there are two uh, revenue sources that are, we're, we're assuming a decline, cable franchise fees and our internal cost allocation. Why is that? There's, uh, Typically, uh, first of all, a two-year lag. It, it, it's well. Go ahead. Explain. Uh, explain the cost allocation, budget officer. <laughs> <laughs> at, a, at a very high level. Um, so, if you think of the the city overhead in the general fund, so the city manager's office, finance, HR, IT, we allocate that out and charge it to other departments. So that that decrease that you see is a is a redistribution of those costs. Uh, toward the general fund. So the general fund's con consuming more of those services. So that's why you see us collecting less from other funds. So it's an expense for the utility 
transportation, WVCC, and it's a revenue source for the general fund. So it's a it's a it's a one year reset, and then we're expecting increases in the out years. What? Member Bennett. What's driving that change? What what? what uh... So so there's lots of factors that go into it. It could be projects that IT is working on for. Uh, police or fire or finance uh, to redistribute that, that cost toward the general fund and away from other funds. So, so we see lots of fluctuations every year from that. Huh. Is this the first time, though, we've seen a reduction in that allocation? No, I don't believe so. Okay. Because I, I, I know as you deal with other parts of this, you hear a lot about how much the city is charging on the direct allocation. I, so I always assumed it just goes up. Uh, over the years, so and I had never heard someone say, "Gosh, they just lowered our <laughs> our allocation to the central program." So, so it's a great point. So as a whole, the cost uh, for those support services goes up, but the the use of those services changes. So that's why when you isolate the general fund, it might use more of those services, so it gets less revenue from the other funds. So overall, it's going up. So less other funds are paying less. Okay, Member Anderson. Thank you. So that's the explanation for the missing part of the $41 million. Uh, no, I don't believe so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> you would have said yes. We could have moved on, but yeah. <laughs> the, the forty-one point five is not missing. Pardon me. The forty-one point five is not missing. It's just built into those revenue projections. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I'll send it to you. Okay, <laughs> then I'm sure you will. <laughs> then uh, my other question is looking at A three. Where in there do you show the operating? So if you look at fees for service in the first year, fiscal year 2021, with a 60% increase. Yes, that's so, it. So that's the jump from this year's estimate to next year's full $7.2 million. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. Member Sund. Thank you. Was the internal, or the internal cost allocation called the support services charge last year? That's correct. We attempted so, to rebrand it. I like the rebranding. Uh, <laughs> so how much is that worth to the general fund? Because you had 6.5% increase and then 6, 4, 6, 4 in last year's forecast. So now we're at negative 1, 6 and then 4, 3, 3, 3. How much money are we talking about? So I believe the this year's forecast is just under $9 million for the, the revenue that we received for that from other funds. And that's representing the reduction of 1.6 from last year or that's from correct. this current year. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I hope you'll be ready for a deep dive on that one during budget. I, I'd really like to understand how those costs are are ending up with these kinds of variables: uh, a negative 1.6 and then out four, and why there isn't the steady. Increases sure. yes, costs I'd be happy are driven to. by by the services we provide other funds from yep. the general fund. Yeah. We'll we'll get that out well ahead of, of the next budget committee yeah, meeting. I think it would help to just understand what's going on there. Yep. Okay. Okay. Seeing no other questions, please proceed. Uh, so for next steps, uh, you received the forecast this evening. Uh, the City Council has their policy agenda meeting on January 21st, which will help inform the budget also. Uh, beginning um, you know, these last couple weeks, departments are working on their budget proposals for the city manager that will help inform his proposed budget to this uh, budget committee. It will be presented at that first budget committee meeting on April 15th. Uh, and then we have several meetings scheduled and then budget adoption in June with a public hearing. Member Bennett. From then, this forecast, as we move into the council policy agenda, what's the message to, to us as we work on our policy agenda? What, what kind of, of limitations have you placed on that process in terms of new, newer enhanced programs? New limits. <laughs> the, yeah. 
Wouldn't that be nice? What's well, an election year? Let's let's figure out. <laughs> the the information that will be available tomorrow uh, for the Tuesday work session will have uh, summaries of each of the items that councilors requested in November. Depending upon the item, uh, there will be a, a budget impact, and and certainly staff will be prepared to help. Uh, counselors understand trade-offs that will be required. I think uh, a theme for Tuesday and a theme for April will be restraint. Mm -hmm. While we have better news than we have had in the past, there's still <laughs> yeah, sure. there there is you know there's still a need for 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 restraint. <laughs> uh, and and the forecast is not the budget. It is a guide for you, uh, a guide for the department directors as they uh, prepare budget requests, as I prepare a proposed budget that attempts to be responsive to a city council's uh, policy agenda, certainly responsive to feedback that the budget committee, uh, comments that the budget committee may provide tonight, and that allows us to continue services. And that would be the other other theme uh, for going forward is is continuation of some of the great work that the council has initiated that the city is doing. Uh, Director Fernandez uh, summarized a, a few of those examples and certainly as council, the budget committee considers, well, can we do more for sidewalks or uh, pedestrian crossings, uh, staff on the 21st, and then certainly a deeper dive during the budget process with you will be able to help with trade-offs and what that might mean if council, the budget committee, were to, want, were to choose to try to enhance services. Excellent. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Barron to talk about the revenue initiatives. As, as uh, Bob is coming up, we felt it was very important. Uh, thank you for the question, Member Anderson. Uh, because of the Budget Committee's role uh, in prior years in, in, in having the revenue initiatives that City Council approved get as far as they did, uh, that we provide you with a very thorough uh, update uh, beyond, and perhaps there we'll find the missing $41 million. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so you're fu fully uh, updated on, on the impacts of the operations fee and also to share with you uh, the uh, uh, employee payroll tax uh, status. Great. Again, uh, Robert Barron, uh, Chief Financial Officer. My uh, presentation is only eight slides long. I think we did two slides a page, both sides. So you should have uh, two pages stapled together so you could follow along. One of the charts is kind of small, so it was important that I be able to give you a physical copy so that you can uh, follow along. Uh, I recently made this presentation to the Salem uh, uh, City Club, and I began with this slide because in addition to uh, the, the City Club had asked me uh, to assess the financial health of the city, and I said uh, the city has, uh, uh, has strong financial management and adequate reserves, but if you don't want to rely only on my statements, let's take a look at a rating agency's review. And our last review was in February of 2018 uh, by Moody's. You can see on the left side of the slide that they rated us AA2. It's the equivalent of the AA for Standard and & Poor's and Fitch. But I also pulled from the report the comments from the uh, uh, from the uh, ratings report that talks about our credit strengths, uh, well-managed, as I had said, and healthy reserves. Our reserve and our general fund is currently above the city's policy of 15% of the uh, um, operating expenses. However, in these rating reports, they also speak to us about uh, impacts that can improve our credit rating or that can have a downward uh, impact on our credit rating. And you could see that it's the consumption or the addition to our fund balance. 
Um, I came from Connecticut. I was a chief financial officer in Connecticut. I was an annual issuer of debt, anywhere between 20 and $50 million worth of debt every year, and I was before all three rating agencies. It was only an hour train ride down to New York. So every year we secured a triple A rating. You'll see it's two rungs above the highlighted double A2 that Salem is rated. The biggest difference that I find is something we're gonna talk about later in the presentation. In Connecticut, there was no state statutory limit on how much you can raise property taxes. If you adopted a budget, you could back into the property tax rate that you needed to fund a budget. We were required to present balanced budgets every year. But we all know that's not true in Oregon. Uh, we have a limit on the ability to raise property taxes, and frankly, that limit for, as Josh had indicated, which uh, on property taxes, which is over 50%, of all the revenues that come into the general fund is limited and has not kept pace with our, um, with our growing expenses. So I think it's up arrow, right? No? Sir? Right arrow. Right arrow. Great, thanks. Um, so I like this slide because it, it, it tells us two things. It tells us that uh, Salem's financial situation is impacted by the cost of providing uh, essential city services, but it also uh, defines what uh, we say the essential city services are, and those are the services that ensure that our community remains safe and livable. Um, our community is growing, but our resources are not growing uh, enough to keep up with those expenses. So here's a slide. Uh, this is the one that I wanted you to be able to have the paper copy on, on so that you can uh, follow along. So let's talk uh, more about the why additional funds are needed uh, or why we have, you may have heard it uh, referred to as a structural deficit. It's simply that the revenues that we're bringing in are less than the cost of providing the essential city services that we described on the second um, uh, slide. If you look at the very top chart, you'll see the adopted budget for this fiscal year. This is what the council adopted of general fund revenues at $128.9 million, but they adopted expenditures of 139.8. That is a 10 million or $10.9 million deficit. And so you may ask, well, what happens when you spend more than you bring in? And where does that money come from? Well, it comes from our fund balance. You'll hear it referred to as uh, working capital or the rainy day fund or even the city savings account. So if we spend more than we bring in, it reduces the amount that we have in the, uh, in the uh, fund balance. There's another reason, uh, uh, the main reason the council would adopt uh, uh, a budget like this is because uh, the council believed that these were the expenditures necessary to provide the essential city services that we talked about on the previous slide. But there's also another reason, is that the council, uh, on the, the budget office's advice, realized that we didn't really anticipate using $10.9 million worth of, uh, of our savings account or of our fund balance, and that's illustrated in the middle section. It's expressed in millions of dollars here, but you'll see that same red 10.9 million, but right below it, we budget $3 million worth of contingencies, those things that we don't anticipate in the budget. Historically, we've only spent uh, about 500,000 of the 3 million. So we anticipate not spending all of the contingency or $2.5 million less. As a budgeting practice, we budget 
100% of all authorized positions for 12 full months. Well, we know that uh, some people leave in August and we try to hire them and they don't get, uh, their replacement doesn't get hired until December. There's vacancies there. Or we have an open position at the beginning of the year that isn't hired until December. Well, there's savings in there. Historically, we've uh, analyzed that and are estimated that to be about $2.6 million. So that $139.8 million worth of expenditures, we didn't anticipate spending the full 139.8. So that with those two numbers added back, what was really anticipated was a consumption of 5.8 million. We started off with an adopted budget using 10.9. We've added back this 5.1 and now we're at 5.8. Let's now look at the bottom uh, chart. The far right column is the same fiscal year that we've been talking about, this fiscal year 2020. If you look at the bottom, it's only showing we're forecasting $2.3 million utilization. And the reason why we're going from the 5.8 to the 2.3 was the adoption of the operations fee. Remember, it's 7.1 million for the first full year. We adopted it half year, effective January 1st. We're gonna get about half of that, our 3.5 million. So instead of consuming 5.8 million, we're forecasting that we're going to consume $2.3 million. Now that's, a, that's a, a good news story, but I wanna tell you what the rating agencies are looking at. Remember the first slide where they said uh, a significant change in your fund balance will, could have an impact on your rating. Let's take a look at the last three years of audited financials. And you'll see beginning with fiscal year 2017 that we took in, I'm gonna have to look at my sheet here, I can't make that out. Um, we took in 1.3 million less than we spent. So we used up 1.3 million of fund balance in 17, 1.8 in 18, and 2.8 in 19. These are not forecasts, these are audited financials. We've consumed working capital for three years running and we're forecasting a fourth year. Um, now is the time uh, because working capital, your savings account is a finite amount of money, is that it will not be there forever if we continue to consume the working capital and we don't stem that consumption. So what, um, let's see. I think we can uh, uh, go on. So. We've already talked about the, the property taxes are our largest current source of revenue in the general fund. So how do we address that issue of consumption of working capital or consumption of our fund balance? Well, we had, to, we had two proposed new sources of income. The first, as we've, as we've already discussed, was the operating fee that's expected to bring in about 7.1 million. And the second one is going to be on the ballot in May. That's the employee paid payroll tax. And when effective, in its first full year of collection, should generate about 9.1 million. 7.1 and 9.1, uh, we're looking to raise $16.2 million. This, we also alluded to this earlier, property taxes is our current revenue source, largest current revenue source, uh, and, um, and it is limited in how much it grows, uh, limited to that 3% that we've experienced in each of the last um, several years. So if this is our current uh, largest revenue source, um, and then we've proposed two more revenue sources. Let's take a look at those individually. The first is the operating fee uh, that it has, uh, was effective January 1st. Uh, the operating fee is billed on the utility bill and it's a flat fee 
based on a per unit use. You'll see a single family home pays $8 a month. For most of us, $8 a month times 12 months, that's a total cost of $96. And then there's other rates for multifamily home commercial and institutional accounts. The council was very careful to make sure that there was rate relief associated with this, should that $96 be too much of a burden for um, some of our taxpayers. Our next uh, proposal, this is the ballot measure in May, is the employee paid payroll tax. Uh, this is going to come in at a sliding scale, also protecting the uh, folks that earn a, a little less money. No uh, employee paid payroll tax for minimum wage, and it's a scale for up to uh, $15 an hour, 2.66%, and earning $50,000 a year, 0.39%. We wanted to make these numbers real. Our average, uh, um, uh, media, our, our median income, I'm sorry, in the city of Salem is in the high 49,000. So if you take that $50,000 number and multiply it times the 0.39%, you come up with $195. So a single family person earning $50,000 that lives in a home and also paying the utility bill will have a combined impact of less than $300, $96 for the operating fee, $195 for the um, payroll tax. And that's annual, not monthly. Right? Annual, exactly. Thank you very much. Member Anderson. Um, so I see the tax rate if you make up to 15 and at 50,000, what if somebody makes say 40,000? Would they pay the 0.39 or the 0.266 for? And anything over $15 an hour is the 0.39. That, that was just an example of, for, uh, the, the, so I could calculate the 195. Uh, but it's a very good question. Uh, right, minimum up to minimum, well, minimum wage is nothing. Minimum wage to 15 is the 0.266. And greater than $15 an hour is the 0.39. That's a good point. Uh, we should probably change that slide. Thanks for catching that. Member so, Sund. Oh, is, oh, it, sorry. is it sorry, great, greater than or does it include 15? Uh, you know what? That's so funny. I'm going to have to ask because at one time we had a difference between the ordinance and, and what we were presenting, and we fixed it. $15 an hour, I believe, is included at the 0.39 because that's how I came up with the 195. And this, uh, yeah. yeah, 15 and over is the 0.39. And over. So, thank you for that. So. Um, these two revenue uh, items will help us continue to provide the essential uh, city services that have been part of the approved budget in each of the last four years. It'll also help us address the short-term uh, needs. The, the, just as a, uh, as a note, the council had said the $9.1 million, the employee paid payroll tax, will be applied towards public safety. So it's going to be a dedicated uh, resource. Um, and um, and the, I, I guess the title of this slide tells us by sharing the cost, we can keep Salem safe and livable. I, I guess what I failed to mention on the employee paid payroll tax is, um, and Tom, you, you made a great point uh, at, at the city club meeting, but it is applied to those uh, people that are working inside Salem uh, and self-employed people were not included and in, uh, retirement income is not included. So what is included is people working inside the city of Salem, which includes the 60,000 people that we uh, estimate live outside the city limits, but enjoy all of the um, services and the infrastructure that the city of Salem provides because they work here in the city. Uh, member Hoy and Member Lewis. 
Thank you. I wanted to follow up. I actually saw your presentation at the City Club and I thought it was quite good and I mentioned that it, this would be probably good for others to hear as well. But you said something there that you just repeated and I wanted to question you about that and sure. that's the retirement income that's exempt. I don't recall that we exempted that in our ordinance and I can tell you as a retiree, I pay income tax on my retirement. I, I think that's an, uh, an important distinction because this was not established as an income tax. So at the end of the year where you determine how much you've earned and then you have a portion of that paid, this is based on your hourly wage on a per paycheck uh, basis. This is how w we've yet to negotiate all the terms with the Department of Revenue who we hope will administer the program for us, but uh, this is how uh, uh, it was established is that it would be based on the hourly wage, the percentage you're done, uh, um, the percentage that is applied to your income earned as an hourly wage, not as an annual income, which is different. Okay. And that's how retirement income is captured. We have a couple questions on the floor. Member Leung, then uh, Member Davis, and Member Lewis. Hi, Hi. Um, so I have a question in terms of um, who would be paying the employee pay payroll tax. There are some questions, hypotheticals that people in the community gave to me that I kind of wanted to check in with you about. Sure. Um, so for example, um, someone who has an office and works in Salem, but their paycheck, um, because that business is, let's just say Eugene, comes from an address in Eugene, that person would not pay an employee pay payroll tax would only come from anybody who has a payroll that has a Salem address? Well, the, the, like I said, uh, many of these details have yet to be worked out and we're going to be negotiating with the Department of Revenue to determine what we can ascertain about the location of where the employee is. Um, uh, there, there's been other questions like, what if I'm a bus driver and I'm driving the bus part of the time in Salem and outside? I, I, I'm sorry, we simply do not have all of those questions answered yet, but we are, um, um, uh, the, we, we plan on working that out and getting that information out. Okay. Member Davis. Hi, I'm just wondering if the, um, the rates, if that was calculated to cover the 10 million or the 2 million, I mean, what's the expected revenue from, the, what are the employees gonna be paying for? The, How much is that supposed to get? The employee paid payroll tax, uh, the person making $50,000 that's paying $195 a year, uh, in the aggregate, uh, we anticipate it to generate $9.1 million. Okay, Member Lewis. Okay, um, follow up on uh, Councilor Young's questions specifically. I, I'm thinking about the, um, the uh, self-employed, let's use an example of a, uh, a single trial office, trial lawyer office, um, that don't really have a, a, an employee payroll, but has income. As a self-employed person, that would be um, not subject to the tax. Uh, our our uh, working assumption now is that all self-employed uh, people will be exempted from the tax. And capital gains? Yes, because because it's an uh, it's based on an hourly rate. Right. It is not an income tax. Okay. Uh, the, you're right. The, those those types of questions would uh, certainly um, complicate the. Uh, the business rules for the Department of Revenue's um, administration. And uh, they were all thought of, but the proposal as it stands now is in, uh, based on an hourly rate. Okay, Member Anderson. Thank you. Um, let's take the hypothetical trial lawyer who has the sole practitioner. There's, there's different ways you can set up your office. The lawyer could say, I'm a subchapter C corporation, or could say, I'm a limited liability corporation, or could say, I'm a PC, which many lawyers do, which stands for I don't, private corporation. And under that kind of scenario, if you were working in, as a, for a private corporation, you're getting a paycheck, you're getting a salary. Um, um, under the situation where you're sole proprietor pass through, that's not viewed as a salary. That, that's my response to that. 
um, hypothetically, of course, then my, my other, in response to Councillor uh, Leung's question, in my private practice as a lawyer, I'm going to offer an opinion, and I'm looking at the city attorney up there. It says, everyone who works in Salem pays a tax. So to me, it does not make any difference if your employer writes your, is, is the Eugene Corporation or a um, Portland Corporation, but you work in Salem full time, uh, you're going to pay the tax. Uh, is Dan? <laughs> now, I also, while he's coming up, the, the, I, I was actually, the bus thing was the thing, uh, a situation that I uh, presented to uh, Mr. Barron because the uh, manager of the Salem Kaiser Transit District said, what do we do in these situations? He came up to me after the city club because our drivers, they don't work the whole time in. And I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm sure Dan does or will. As Mr. Barron said, a lot of this is to be decided because we're going to have to work it out and there'll be rules and potential amendments to the ordinance coming back to council to kind of suss all that out. But I, I think what you said is completely accurate other than the, the reference to full time. So a part time employee who works mm -hmm. the, for the time they work in Salem would be subject to the tax as well. Okay, Mr. Barron. Great. So um, the, the, I, I think with Josh's presentation, uh, Josh has a, a little more for us, uh, but with Josh's presentation that shows our current um, uh, uh, fund balance estimate for the current year at roughly 20 million and five years out declining to 10 million. And then my presentation where we've looked at the last three years of audited where we've been consuming fund balance. I think that uh, that lends a lot of weight to uh, Mr. Power's instruction that we exercise um, some caution because every, every position that is, is added or every dollar of expense that is added is that much less working capital or fund balance. Uh, we've done our best to reallocate uh, resources. We're going through a citywide effort of reallocating resources. As a matter of fact, on your council agenda coming up on the 27th, um, uh, I'm giving up one of my positions and we're proposing that the funding, the position and the dollars be used in the IT department because they've identified a need. You'll, you'll get a staff report on that. So it's not all incremental costs. We're doing our best to reallocate resources as, as we can. Um, but, but, but there is, uh, we really do have to watch out how much uh, we're consuming that working capital. Just a final thought. The, um, the rating agencies don't mind if you use working capital or your fund balance. It is what it's there for when you have unanticipated expenses or you have an unknown source of revenue to cover these expenses, but they want to see a plan to restore that fund balance and to build it up. It is not a fiscally prudent plan to continue to consume the fund balance with no plan to uh, build it back up. Mr. Barron, um, yes. if the voters approve this payroll tax, when would the city be able to expect it to start? Is it this budget year? Is it the next budget cycle? I just wonder in terms of, I think we have our meeting on May 6th. Yeah. I think the voters vote on May 7th. I, I wanted to make sure that I, I say uh, the, what, what we've been publishing. Uh, we, we don't know because we need to uh, uh, negotiate it with the Department of Revenue. But what we've done is we, we said, uh, when we have met with the Department of Revenue, and they said programming took them about a year for the marijuana tax. So we were estimating about a year, and we're saying July of 2022 at the earliest. So that would be fiscal year. 2023. So it's uh, the $9.1 million will not impact this upcoming year's budget that this budget committee was formed for. The upcoming year's budget is fiscal year 2023.
21. So it would be two years from the budget that you're uh, working on now. Thank you. Member Nordyke. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really appreciate how all of you are taking a lot of time and effort to break this down into plain English. Uh, all of you guys have advanced degrees and financial backgrounds, but a lot of our listeners may not. So all the efforts that you make to continue to break it down so that we can all understand it. If folks understand the measure, they can make an informed decision on whether to vote against or in favor of the measure. So I appreciate that. Please keep up the good work. Uh, one of the takeaways that I get from this, because you know, as I go and explain to people what this means and what it doesn't mean, um, it seems like it's safe to say, if you don't work, you don't pay under this measure. Is that something that we can say confidently? Because that will be a question that I will get. Well, if you work and you own a single family home, you're, sti you're still receiving the operations fee, I, I guess. But if I just mean for, for oh. the payroll tax. Oh, for the payroll tax, for yes. For payroll absolutely. tax, you don't work, you don't pay. Absolutely. And it's a And it's a trickier question as to if you work for your, it's not entirely clear if you work for yourself, you don't pay because of what Member Anderson mentioned. There are a number of types of organizations where you may be a sole proprietor, but you pay yourself a salary. But those are, you know, tax decisions. When you decide how to incorporate yourself as a business, those are decisions you can make um, in consultation with your, your tax planner, your accountant, and so forth. So anyway, I'm just trying to do what I can to make sure that whenever I'm explaining it, I want to make sure I understand it and Great. being accurate. So Great. thank you. Thanks so much. Um, on, on that same point, um, two quick questions. First of all, just to clarify, all of this money is dedicated to public safety? All of the employee paid payroll tax is dedicated to uh, public safety, yes. OK. And I think that will be very persuasive for a lot of people to say them. I think a common argument against this will be that self-employed, in other words, they will characterize that as rich business people, pay nothing. The only tax is paid by working class people. So what would be the response to that? In other words, why are self-employed excluded and only workers taxed? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think there was a variety of ways that this could have been approached. I like the way Councillor Anderson uh, handled that question. He actually posed it differently. He said, you know, some cities have an employer paid payroll tax instead of burdening the employee. And I believe, Tom, you had said when you intuitively you think, well, who has uh, a better ability to pay, the employer or the employee? And so initially he had said, well, maybe we should be leaning towards an employer paid. But then he thought about all of the exempted businesses, the, the, the government, the state government that are here, and how they would be exempted. And then if we go to the employee paid payroll tax, how we would be able to tax people that are working in the city and enjoying our services um, that, not, that don't necessarily live inside the city. So I, I, I think it's, it, it was the, um, the best of scenarios uh, and, and as how we arrived at this particular form, uh, formulation. I, I, I don't know if I have an answer to how, how the rich people that don't take their money as a salary uh, that are taking it as a dividend or something so and to avoid that, yeah. 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 And, and <laughs> yeah. Member Anderson. My question isn't so much not doing the employee paid payroll tax as much as why would self-employed people not be subject to the same tax? I mean, in other words, up to, you know, if they don't make a lot of money, they don't pay anything. Um, so minimum wage pays nothing. If they earn up to $15 equivalent an hour, which would be times 2,080 hours full-time per year. Okay, thank you. Wow, but you're good. Um, in, in other words, basically be subject to the same tax from each according to their ability to each according, or yeah where they would pay based upon their ability just like the workers are asked to. Well, our city attorney uh, also th th repeated what I had said earlier. All of the details have uh, uh, yet to be worked out. 
but my my understanding Paul, is that uh, yes. we had to develop business rules that were actionable by the Department of Labor. Uh, the, 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 like a yes, no, if this, yeah, then yes, if that, then no. And uh, having them trying to discern whether it was an equivalent of 15 or more, and how many hours do you assume with a self-employed person? Um, and we defaulted to uh, self-employed people would not be taxed. Member Hoy. And just to kind of put a little finer point on that, we, we basically had the choice of figuring out how to assess it and collect it ourselves, which we have a very limited ability to do that, i.e. the utility bill, or we had to go to somebody else who could assess it and, and collect it for us, and that meant the Department of Revenue. And so that really limited us to the income tax and uh, to, the, to the payroll, and so it really limited our options for that kind of thing. So it wasn't an intentional, oh, we want to exclude those people. It really was uh, part of the just the was one it was the best choice that we had the best choice that we had didn't include everybody that's the bottom line member anderson you ask my cousin anderson you ask the same uh, you know that's a political uh, social economic question that is a valid question and it's really not for Mr. Barron or the staff to try to answer it's for the council to try to answer because mm -hmm. it was a political reason and in a perfect world, I might say it should be income. It should, the people who are earning capital gains and the people who are earning money off a business that they own, the profits as opposed to a salary, but that just was beyond Byzantine to try to figure out how to do that without just having something on your income tax form at the end of the year and I, you know, I don't even know how we would do that. So that's the uh, polit more political answer to your question. And Mr. Barron was exactly right about my views on the employer paid versus employee paid, why I came to the conclusion, again, a political conclusion, why it's better to go with the employer than it is the, em excuse me, with the employee rather than the employer because we can capture all these other people we would never be able to capture if we went to an employer paid tax because the state's not going to pay. None of the state's employees, you know, are going to have tax paid for them or by them. Okay, uh, Member Bennett and then uh, Member Sund. Uh, I'm going to kind of go back to, uh, sort of to uh, Thelma and Louise for just a minute. Yeah, yeah I, I appreciated you going by, but I want to I want to watch him go over the cliff for a minute. Uh, you call it working capital, and that's a great description, I guess. Uh, I would call it unexpended revenue, and I'd like to kind of understand what percentage of the general fund are we talking about, and what is a standard? What's a best practice for maintaining unexpended revenue? And I'll, I'll tell you why, because I think over the past several years, one of my concerns has been a growing bank account being collected as taxes from uh, residents of Salem, uh, not being used for services, rather being held as a kind of uh, just a fund uh, that can be used by the council or by, by others to, to provide services. I, I'm just having a little trouble. I want to understand where the magic, where is the sweet spot here? Are we there, or is this again? We're five years from the problem, and that's the. And I'm in my fifteenth year of hearing that statement. It is understandably a uh, a, a frequently asked question, um, and unfortunately, the answer it depends. It depends on the volatility of the. Uh, revenue stream and well, no, expenditure wait minute, wait stream. You're telling me that rating agencies are looking at this information and somehow would uh, reduce or in, uh, would impact our uh, costs for borrowing money. And is there no standard for what you have to have as a percentage of the general fund uh, in your? Uh, uh, unexpended revenue that would say, 
you know, I mean, we can go up and down or down for a while. It seems like we've sure. had a lot of money in this uh, fund. Uh, sure. And uh, the, forgive me for being obtuse. Uh, the, the, uh, um, I was the president of the Connecticut chapter of the GFOA. I was uh, involved in a lot of these discussions. And the reason why I said it depended is because nationwide, a general fund fund balance for AAA rated communities is north of 30%. Our policy is 15%. However, it depends on the volatility of your revenue and your expenditure streams. I was a AAA rated community in the city of Norwalk for the eight years I, uh, I worked there, but I only had 12% of my $340 million general fund operating budget. So it depended how come the nationwide average is north of 30% for AAA rated communities, and yet I was AAA rated with 12.1%, I think, the last year I was there. And the reason was is because we did not have a volatile or a cap on our revenue stream. Remember what a reserve is set aside for. I mean, uh, we, in an ideal world, we budget a dollar of expenditures for every dollar of revenue coming in. We don't plan on spending that reserve. The reserve is set aside for something that is unanticipated. And so if in any given year you have the unfettered ability to raise your taxes and cover all of your expenses, you don't need as large of a reserve. So at 12.1%, I was rated AAA. Nationwide average, I can tell you, a AAA rated community are north of 30%. Our policy now is 15%, and we are above that policy now. How far uh, above it are we? D d d just, just by a little bit, it, it's a it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a little bit of a misnomer. Remember how we had 139 uh, 139.8 million dollars worth of uh, of expenditures. Let's call it 140. 15 percent of that is 21 million, right? But we have 22 million. But you know our policy is based on revenues. And the adopted revenues were only 128 million. So if you wanted to go strict policy, you would do 15% of the 128 million. But at some point, what my recommendation, what I hope the presentation impressed upon you, is we should not be adopting budget where we're planning on consuming working capital every year. And so if we have $140 million worth of expenses, 15% of that is $21 million. We currently have $22 million. Yeah, I, I understand. I, I understand what you're saying. I think your AAA rating target is, is an interesting one. Uh, that is not what our council policy has been about as long as I've been aware of it. It's, it's been 15 or whatever the percentage is. And uh, I understand the volatility, although we actually have a fairly stable tax system in our 3% growth rate tied up in it. And I, part of, I think, what you have to be able to explain to voters is, is really where are we exactly. And when we budget, uh, we're not budgeting kind of willy-nilly. I mean, we actually are saying our need actually is this, our amount of funds available, and we have this uh, additional revenue sitting there. And the question is, is that some sort of inviolate account? Uh, the only time I've seen it become a real problem for us has been during the recession. Uh, that I, I, thank I, you just, for, you see what my No, no, of is? course. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk about this because this is uh, topics of uh, sessions that are government finance officer uh, uh, conferences that are held annually. Typically, what you would want to use a reserve for, determine the appropriate uh, level of reserve. The, the council will do that. They've done it at 15%. Yeah. But if you want to consume that, you don't want to consume it for ongoing expenses because a reserve is a finite amount of money, and if you exhaust it, those ongoing expenses grow and grow, and then 
when the reserve is exhausted, then how do you afford to pay for that huge delta that you've created? Mm -hmm. Typically, what you would want to use a reserve for is one-time or non-recurring expenses. Uh, and I think that would be in a, if we're talking to the taxpayers, Mayor, I, I would say that the council determines an appropriate level of reserve for this amount of general fund expenditures. We have committed to only using those for one-time expenditures, and when we use it, we plan to restore that level of reserve at a fiscally prudent level, currently 15%. But, but to use it for ongoing expenses and seeing that chart where at some point you exhaust that money, it makes it very hard to fund that very next year without dramatic expenditure uh, decreases. So that uh, chart is not really based on what we budget, it's, but you're, it's an assumption about what was a, uh, a single expenditure for last year or the year before because uh, I'm trying to remember what we, we bought, aside from opening a, a fire station that we desperately needed, uh, that had that kind of ongoing cycle you're describing that we can't pull back from. And I know as we go into the budget cycle, a lot of what we'll talk about are kind of one-year expenditures, two-year expenditures to do certain kinds, whether it's a a new auditing program or it's getting our climate action uh, work in place or those tend to be duration uh, activities. They don't have that kind of ongoing uh, expense. And so I'm trying to understand how to differentiate as we go into budgeting the kinds of things that are appropriately allocated to this uh, uh, unexpended revenue and what then do we have to look at as part of our uh, policy consideration relative to the 15 percent. Sure. I, um, uh, I, 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 I think what we see here in yellow, you'll see that in 2017 we began the year with 28.1 million dollars and we're forecasting at the end of this year, four years later, to be at 19.9 and in the presentation that Josh had, we're forecast in five years to be at just a little over $10 million. So um, I have no doubt everything you said that a lot of these are one and two years in duration, but we have developed a, tra uh, a trend where, what is that, $10 million on a $30 million basis, uh, where we consumed 33% of our fund balance, and now we're forecast in the next five years to consume another 50%. Uh, this appears to be funding ongoing expenses, okay. not one-time expenses that are replenished in a later year. Okay, we'll start with um, a couple questions on the floor. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Member Sund, please. So it was a, little, a, a ways ago, so kind of going back just really quickly on the $9 million for the employee pay, do you have a sense of how much of that is related to employees uh, that do live in Salem? Uh, I, uh, you know 70, what? 30. I, I would like to give you an answer. I know Maybe 60 per, or 60,000, I remember that number, are coming in. Mm -hmm. But let me give, uh, let me send that to all the okay. committee members to give you an accurate answer. If you could write that down, we'll be sure to get that to you because that is important. So that, that was my first. There's one more. The other thing in the discussion that we just had on working capital, I think. You know, when you look at the the five year, the one encouraging piece, if the pay, if the payroll tax wasn't even on the horizon as a as a possibility, and we weren't, and you were just looking at this, the way I see it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is during this budget season, if the city was to come up with two to three million dollars of efficiency that and ki that was actually sustainable year over year over year, that you'd solve it. Because the incremental right. change to working capital isn't growing. No, it's, it sounds right. right. Two million times five-year forecast, ten million going from twenty million down to ten. It would keep us steady. Now, remember that our budgets are growing, so fifteen percent of that but that's budget would be here. growing too. Okay, but that's already reflected yeah. here, right? So I'm just looking at the change to working capital, two point three eight, and then up because of the 
the operating fee and then 1.3, 2.5. So that's really what you would be solving each year. And incrementally, it's not going up that much. Absolutely. Okay. I, if we found those savings over the uh, over the term, it would have a significant impact on ending working capital. Yeah. Thanks. Like compounding, I guess. Yeah, compounding yeah. impact. Yes. I think still questions from Member Nanke and Member Lewis. Thank you. And just kind of a follow up on on Member Sun's uh, question there, and a, a couple of them. Our our primary imbalance is that revenues do not keep pace with expenditures, the most of that being in employees in wages as well as benefits, uh, PERS, health care, and what have you. So even if we lock that 2.3, it would slowly pull itself away from um, the revenue line. So if we save that 2.3, it, because it's just fundamentally in our system, the way property taxes are limited and the way payroll and, and labor costs go up in this state. But is that not already reflected in the net expenditures in the five-year forecast, this increase that, you, that we're speaking about? Correct. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really And apples. some of that's been tweaked because of a modification in PERS that took place last year. Yeah. So. And we have the operating fee. Correct. And the exactly. operating yeah. and, and it will. We need people to use more water, right? No, not linked to your water. No, I, th I think you're, I think you're <laughs> both absolute, uh, absolutely correct. In as much as our organic increases, our costs are growing at a rate faster than our largest income stream, property tax, which is limited to 3%. In as much as it's right. growing faster, uh, we're not going to address the problem. However, if we do find savings um, uh, in the budget that can be replicated year in and year out, it will have a material compounding yes. positive impact on ending working capital yep. at the end of our five-year forecast. That, and then just two more pieces if I can throw in on that. One was how many uh, Salem residents will be paying the payroll tax. You know what? Josh said he just pulled it up, so because I'm going to step those numbers. away for a moment. Okay. And how many, how many households will not pay the tax in Salem is the other question. For the payroll tax? Correct. So, so in Salem, we have the 60,000 commuters coming in. We have about 34 to 35,000 that live and work here. And then we have about 31,000 that live here and work somewhere else. So, so we have a, a base that lives and works here of about 35,000. <coughs> and those, those are workers, not households. OK. Can we still get that number emailed yes. to us, those percentages? Yeah. Do you have the dot? Sorry. You and if, just my last one, if I can just finish okay. this. Um, in regards to one of the reasons for our ending fund balance or working capital is to get us from July to November when property taxes come in. What is, what is that dollar value? That, that's a great, great Because we question. talked at times about moving our fiscal year to match up with when our income comes in, and that would give us kind of a one-time piece of savings that we could reduce. So, so the expenditures at the end of October were about $27 million. So for that month, we ended up some internal borrowing, some organic borrowing for the general fund. So it's for emergency as well as covering that piece, emergency. and there's some other funds we can draw from during that knowing that they will be replenished as soon as property tax revenue comes in. It's one of the unique aspects of Oregon that you get all your property tax receipts in right. November. Yes. OK, uh, Mr. Uh, Sund, and then Member Lewis. No, I'm fine. Oh, You're good, OK. So on the 35,000, do we have, do you have dollars on that too on, with the payroll tax, like how much is, uh, of the 9 million? Of total, right? Or would it be easy enough to just do the simple? So, so the, the data set doesn't have the wage level completely tied to it, so it'd be tough to get that dollar value associated, but we can make some assumptions and get that out to you. Yeah, I, th I think that would be, I'm just thinking about money mm -hmm. in Salem that's being spent on something that now will shift, right, to something else and the impact. I mean, it could be, if, if it's just 35, if it's just simple math or if it's a different so just the percent of the 9.1 that of people that live and work here where that yes. wouldn't be spent here possibly. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. Member Anderson. Thank you. 
and this follows up on something Bob said, but also something uh, Member Nanke said, and that is, and we've discussed this, we're limited 3% property tax per year. And when um, Mr. Barron was in Norwalk, Connecticut, he wasn't limited. There was no limit on the tax, uh, uh, property tax that could be raised. And if I heard you correctly, the cities can raise their property tax. It's not a statewide thing. Right. Uh, so that, excuse me. Connecticut it, didn't have county government, so it was all for the municipality. Right. So, you know, that's a huge difference. If, if we didn't have the ballot measure that restricted the growth of property tax income, we'd be having a whole different conversation, uh, and it would be a much more pleasant one. Okay, so just um, from the chair, I'll say we have one more presentation by Budget Officer uh, Mr. Eggleston, and then we have, uh, you can tell the, the band hasn't been together in a while, we'll have additional time for discussion among the group, and then um, we don't have public testimony, it doesn't appear, and then adjournment. So just as folks see us get close to the 8 o'clock hour, um, Mr. Eggleston, why don't you come up and give us your presentation on priority-based budgeting. And it is thankfully a single slide. Can you hold the microphone closer to you? Yes, I'm so, I apologize. Uh, so we've uh, we've talked about priority-based budgeting with this group before, uh, and the city is working to build priority-based budgeting into the annual budget cycle. For the second year, each department scored their program, so each uh, activity that they do uh, against these result areas, good governance, natural environment, safe community, safe, reliable, and efficient infrastructure, strong and diverse economy, welcome and livable community. This is how we've organized the budget book. Uh, this is how we've oriented those programs. Uh, this gives the city a complete program inventory of what the city does and how it scored against each of the result areas. The next step is to use that data as a tool to inform decision making. Uh, this last October, we had Chris Fabian from Priority Based Budgeting come out and conduct multiple uh, resource exploration workshops with over 44 employees. Uh, this was a, a practice round to use Resource X. It's the, the tool that all the data is entered into uh, to make recommendations for the possible future of each program. Uh, some examples would be opportunities for cost recovery, efficiency, reallocation. Uh, that's where you stop doing something in order to do something else. You can use those funds in a different way. Uh, it can also identify if more resource, resources are needed for that program. Uh, this was the practice run, and we we're hoping to expand uh, that tool to all programs through the budget process throughout this next year. Do you have any questions? Excellent. That concludes my presentation. <laughs> okay, so in addition to the forecast discussion, this part of the agenda is also an opportunity for the Budget Committee to discuss other issues or concerns. Um, this will be the, the one opportunity for the Budget Committee to have these conversations before our Budget Committee meetings begin in earnest in April. Um, so. Open the floor to comment, question, or otherwise, Member Nordyke. Sure. Thank you all. You know, one of the things I would be interested in learning more about is whether to bring performance auditing to certain programs here at the city. A performance auditing is not the same thing as financial auditing. Performance <coughs> auditing is about looking at whether the programs we have are delivering results. I think that any time you need to make a pitch to voters that we want more of your hard-earned money. It's helpful to show the voters whether the programs you already have are getting results. So performance auditing, auditing can look at things like improving programs and services, uh, revenue, maybe finding ways to find more revenue lying under rocks, improving accountability, uh, improving awareness of risk within certain departments, and basically keeping an eye out for future problems. So I would be interested in finding out whether that's something that we can pursue here as a way to demonstrate whether the programs we want, whether the goals that we have in mind, whether it's public safety, whether it's responding to homelessness, whether it's environmental stewardship, all those things, <coughs> the voters deserve to know whether they're getting the most bang for their buck. 
So that's something I would be interested in exploring, whether that's through this budgetary process or through a city council function, I'm open to that. But I thought to start off at our first budget committee meeting of the year, I wanted to make sure that I brought that up for discussion. <coughs> Any responses on the floor? Uh, Member McCoy? Um, I think that's a good idea, but I would think sort of in a backdoor kind of way, the priority-based budgeting does what you said, mm -hmm. sort of from a different point of view. So everything's graded, what's, what's, what's working, what's effective, what's meeting all the needs in quartiles. So you get that bottom quartile, if cuts are needed, the work's sort of been done in a different, from a different view to, viewpoint, but I think basically the result's what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. and if I could briefly respond to that, I hear what you're saying. However, that's where the program directors themselves are scoring their own programs and the efficacy of their own programs. And with performance auditing, you bring in an independent external perspective. So you would be bringing in someone from outside the city to be gauging those functions because, let's face it, there are incentives to how you score your own programs and your effectiveness. And I know our city staff do their absolute best but incentives are incentives, and I think that auditing is an important function that a lot of cities, a lot of governments, a lot of private corporations, and other bodies who have pots of money, I see that as a way to bring in a fresh perspective. Member Bennett. Uh, I, I think that's a really interesting idea. I think it'd be one, uh, it would be interesting to have the, uh, the manager uh, maybe recommend a program that would be available to have a look at it that way. And I, uh, whether it's homelessness or, or pick one of those programs, I don't know how we would, uh, how we would do it on a long-term basis until we know how it works. I've watched this. I know this process. Uh, it's used in the public schools, and it's a very interesting one. Very controversial when it gets going. It, it really is interesting to watch. Uh, performance auditing and the response, and we see it at state level as well. I'm sure when your department got its Secretary of State's audit, you were both thrilled and shocked. I mean, it, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a really interesting process. Uh, I wanted to add another one. I, I would certainly join you in trying to figure out how to get that into this process, though. Um, I, I would really like to have, uh, as we look at our wish list, I, I think that, all, that will be interesting. Uh, along with the uh, uh, meeting the challenges of the uh, council uh, proposals as we work through our, our process next week, would be to understand very, very, very clearly what's ongoing and what's a one-time deal. I think if, uh, following up on what Mr. Barron said, I think we, I know the one that I'm aware of that caused part of this problem is that was reopening the fire department fire station. And it adds, I mean, I'm just looking at those numbers, it looks like we may be the culprits in this, uh, bringing this about. And I think it, it would be good to know very, very clearly when we're doing it and, uh, and what the impact is. But I don't want to see us have to cut out the one-offs. Uh, that's the ones I'd like to be careful that we don't set up a situation where we have a, uh, an idea like performance auditing or something like that, that we would cut it off because it's got some sort of unanticipated cost that somebody else arrives at. You, you know what I mean? It, it, uh, so I, I, I hope we get a, a shot at it that way, and I hope uh, budget committee members and counselors would be willing to look at their ideas in terms of their long-term impact uh, on this uh, apparently volatile balance that we've watched. Member Anderson. Thank you. Uh, just a, a brief response to the um, performance audit. Um, I am pretty sure that it came before the Budget Committee maybe three years ago or four years ago. And I can't remember what the reasoning was, but it didn't make it through the Budget Committee, even though I agree we ought to look at it again. Um, uh, the other um, thing that uh, shifting gears is, well, that's pretty. It's a pretty good segue shifting gears because I'm I'm telling you right now, and this is part of the climate action situation. 
uh, I would be very interested in seeing, we're going to be buying new cars. We're going we're to be uh, um, spending some budget on, on different vehicles. And I understand that the fire department, although I did see something today, Chief, about an electric uh, fire uh, uh, engine, you know, in some place on the, on the Google. And so, and there are police cars too that have the same problem and or that need to have uh, more powerful engines. And same would be true, Director Fernandez, with the public works. But there's a lot of vehicles that we send around the city that never leave the city that could very easily be electric vehicles. I'm looking at the people, the compliance people who drive it, the parking people, just the general uh, uh, run-of-the-mill pickups that I see, you know, with the inmate work crews as I'm going riding through the park er er every day. So. Uh, I would be very interested in any proposal that comes back for uh, in any way practical that we end up using electric cars as opposed to uh, as opposed to gasoline or diesel driven vehicles and so I'm putting that out now because um, we're going to have a budget proposal at some point and we're going to say we need X new cars and I'd like to see it we need X new cars X new electric cars. Member Hoy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess since we're just talking about uh, potential wish lists, um, my hope is that any money that we spend outside of our current program is only focused on homelessness and we don't expand past that on anything and that we put any extra revenue, so to speak, or uh, any of our flexibility. I think uh, it would be a huge mistake to spend it on anything other than homeless services. I'd like to uh, build on that just a moment of privilege, I suppose. I think throughout the year after um, in the, the budgeting process, we as the budget committee participate in this, and then the city council, as is their right, response to issues comes th that come throughout the year, which is additional spending, which wasn't something that we considered as a budget committee. And I understand that there's a flexibility within the budget, but it seems that it would be prudent to try and forecast or whether it's budget ahead of time or find a way to account for at the end of the fiscal year how much money is spent on a contingency basis for things like homelessness services. That's something we answer questions about in the, in, out in the public when we say this is what we do on behalf of the city. And so um, I guess I would just like to see that either is it part of the wish list or is it saying this is how much we think we need to spend. We heard you know, earlier this year, $5 million was the number identified in, you know, the public services, uh, safety services. Is there additional services that we anticipate spending in the next 12 months? Um, I have another point, but I'll, you know, enjoy this conversation if it develops. Member Anderson. So continuing the uh, wish list idea, um, after being on the budget committee this, uh, this last session, I joined Nextdoor app and I began to follow the discussions and I posted there, what are things that you would want to see from the city? And in just following the conversations, recently homelessness is certainly a huge issue confronting our city. But I'm not exaggerating, probably 80 to 90% of the comments deal with public safety. I mean, that is such a huge priority. And when people hear about that our police department continues to be cut, or has been cut down to, I think it was 189 or 187 officers, something like that, um, that our fire department is really, really strained. Um, I certainly hope that we do a lot for homeless, but I was happy to hear that the, the potential payroll tax will go to public safety. And just giving feedback to the city council, uh, at least in my area, um, public safety really is the issue that people are concerned about right now. Member Nordic. Well, if I can piggyback on that, there's an obvious correlation between addressing homelessness and public safety. Uh, we know that our first responders are on the front lines of handling folks who are homeless, handling folks who are homeless and also suffering from mental illness, handling folks who are homeless and also struggling with drug addiction. And I make sure to parse those out because a lot of times people assume that if you're homeless, you must be an addict. Or if you're homeless, you must be crazy. 
And anyone who's toured a homeless shelter or talked to one of our executive directors knows that in homelessness knows that there's a variety of populations involved. And at some point in time, they may have interaction with our public safety personnel, our paramedics, our EMTs, our firefighters, our police, and so much more. So I appreciate those conversations are intertwined, inextricably so. I think that makes a lot of sense. Member Sund. Thank you. Uh, would it be possible before we get to the next budget meeting to have some more data on by department where, so PERS, we talked about PERS increase this year of 21% you know, for this current budget, and I think it was about $5 million of increase over the last year. Can we kind of understand at the department level, like the tier one specifically, where the, of course we've got police and fire, but just throughout the, the city where kind of what those numbers look like uh, personnel wise uh, that are in that rate category? Because I think it's like 25% for the tier one or something like that. So uh, would that be something that we already have maybe that we could look at? Uh, yeah, it's certainly something we track. So we uh, base all our costs on the, at the position level. So we have that breakdown by department, by employee, with the tier one, two, or OPSERP employees. So we can send that out. Yes. Thank you. Member McQuaid. Um, two things. You're following back up on the uh, performance-based budgeting. Is, it, is that going to be available to us, how the ratings are and what the rankings are for this, this body here to use? If, in fact, at some point we get into a discussion on something needs to be cut, what would it be? We can certainly provide the, the preliminary results, yes. Okay. Uh, and two, I would second um, what Councillor Remember Hoy said on, on homelessness. You know, uh, it strikes me two things. We've talked about, you know, ongoing versus one-time expenses. Well, it, and my sense would be with this homeless issue, if there's going to be, the city's going to be involved, and if they're going to apply <clears throat> programs to deal with it, they're not going to be one-off programs. They're going to be, you know, ongoing, long-term programs. So that's something to factor into your discussions here when, when you make them and the decisions you all have to make because um, there's a, you know, as Jimmy Jones says, it's a 30-year problem, and the mayor said it. You know, this problem has been going on for years and years in building, and now it's to a point um, this economy and a variety of other things um, that it's, it's to a break point, something needs to be done. But that's a big number that's going to impact what you do or don't do with your budget. So. I think before we close, I'd like to one, make um, one suggestion to the agenda developers. Um, you elected me chair, so now I'm going to analyze our agenda. <laughs> <Dangerous. laughs> um, I think, I, yeah, <laughs> I just, last year I remember on our first um, agenda that for the first meeting, I think we had a jumbled order of things at the outset, which led to some confusion in subsequent meetings. And I think it specifically had to do with whether you had enough time to, de to deliver your city manager's message, which I think is really important to, the, to this committee, and then also the order in which we considered the CIP. Because we discussed the CIP, voted and approved the CIP, and then went, when we were looking at the general fund, there were elements of the CIP has the general fund baked into it. And I, I'm sorry that I don't have a suggestion as to how to reorder it so it, it feels like it flows logically, but there's just a number of things that are in the CIP that we essentially approve and then we get to the general fund and then there's a number of one-time expenditures that were you know, previously approved in the CIP. And I, you're nodding, Member Hoy, and I just, I don't know what else to say about it other than it was confusing and it would continue to confuse, yeah. especially newer members of the committee. I think what happened, if I might, Mr. Chair, is that we considered the CIPs like right off the bat before we really had our sea legs under us as a committee. And I think that was the challenge that people really weren't like, oh gosh, we're, we're making these huge decisions and we're really not acclimated yet. So I think if we could delay it into the process a meeting or so, that could be helpful. If I, yeah, I, if I may. A, a thought on that too is, is uh, you see it in other legislative situations where you start with easier stuff 
start us off with, uh, there's a whole batch of smaller funds and budgets that we could kind of get used to each other and get used to how we want to think about it. And like the WVCC? <laughs> <laughs> I would have start with the top budget just to throw people into it. Right, right. <laughs> it, it, if but I, I, I if exactly I may. what you're saying. You're dealing with millions and millions of dollars and, and really a, a substantial. I can sure, budget. I can assume from uh, Director Fernandez's standpoint, let's get it out of the way. You know, yeah, let's, well, let's get an early vote. But we like to I, I like uh, the band analogy. You know, it's I think we're going to be making better music by the second or third meeting yeah. than we are the first. So we Thank you for we that completely. guidance, and we'll, we'll adjust the agendas accordingly. So we, we took that in consideration when we developed the budget calendar. So for your first meeting, uh, the budget message, and then a couple easy result areas, welcome to livable community and natural environment stewardship, and then the CIP and all the infrastructure at the second meeting. Okay. Talk about results. I just said it, and then boom. <laughs> there it is. This is intoxicating. Yeah, seriously. They were typing as fast as they could. <laughs> they were cut and pasted. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so um, I will say, is there any other business for the budget committee this evening? Any other topics of conversation? Okay, seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped an important step. What happened? Is there anyone present who did not have an opportunity to provide testimony on agenda items? This is our last chance for public testimony. Is there anyone present who would like to provide testimony regarding issues not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, the meeting is adjourned. Oh, that's, you know, you